the President's remarks to summer government workers at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C., June the 20th, 1962. Mr. Bell, Mrs. Lockheim, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to see you in Washington. I appreciate your willingness to come down and uh, submit yourselves to the living on the bullseye here. I sometimes wish I just had a summer job here, but I <laughs> do... Uh, I do want to uh, say what an opportunity it is for us in the federal government to have you here. These programs of bringing uh, young Americans, particularly college students, to Washington every summer to work in the various departments have been going on for a great many years. The federal government does not do this out of uh, largesse. It does it because it hopes that in the one month or two months that you come to Washington and work uh, with us, that you will become sufficiently interested in government as a career, that many of you will come back. And that in that way, we can attract to the National Governmental Service uh, the best of the talent of our country, those who are most interested, those who are most committed. This has been going on, as I've said, for a great many years. What we've been attempting to do uh, this year, however, is to uh, spread your interest. Those who may work in the State Department or the Department of Defense, those who may work in the White House or in the executive office, do get a very clear idea, whether it may be because of carrying messages from one part of the building to another, or working in more sophisticated jobs, they get some idea of what uh, the work of the government department in their area may be. But what we are anxious to do is to use this time while you are here to give you as much information, as broadly based and as sophisticated as is possible. And therefore, during the next uh, two months, with your help and cooperation, uh, we will attempt to bring to your attention some of the many facets of governmental service. It is my judgment that there is no career that could possibly be open to you in the 1960s that will offer to you as much satisfaction, as much stimulus, as little compensation, uh, perhaps financially, as, uh, <laughs> as being a, a servant of the United States uh, government. I think within all of us, and really in a sense I suppose endowed almost by nature, in addition to a natural desire to advance uh, our own interests, there is also a parallel desire, and that is to be part of a great enterprise of public service. The totalitarian uh, powers have uh, exploited that. Even in Cuba, Mr. Castro's emphasis certainly at the beginning was on a desire to improve the lot uh, of the Cuban people. And therefore, in China, we had all these examples of people spending their day off going out on illiteracy, health, building dams, doing all the things to build a, a better country. This is in all of us. I think that it's a more difficult and subtle problem in a democracy, with a great deal of emphasis, of course, on individual liberty, on the right of pursuing our private interests, and so on, so that uh, while there is this desire, it doesn't, uh, frequently it does not have a chance to express itself. But the desire is there, and it is our hope that the desire is there stronger in these years than ever before. And I think the response to the Peace Corps indicates how real this feeling is. The willingness of thousands of young Americans, and some not so young, to volunteer to serve uh, their country and a much larger constituency than their country in dozens of countries overseas. I hope that, uh, in fact, I know you would not be here, uh, that you feel uh, the same way. And that when you leave here in August, that you will come back in uh, other days when you have finished your studies and be willing to give part of your time in life uh, to the service of our country. When I say come back, I do not mean it uh, in the geographic sense. It may be that your service will take place in your own community or in your own county or in your own state, but to contribute part of your lives, part of your effort, if not all, to the advancement of the great interests of this country. I do not regard the great interests of this country in a narrow sense. Our interests are really uh, the free world's interests. And I am constantly impressed, day after day, with the fact that this rather small country, in the relative sense, only 6% of the world's population, that we are carrying the burden for the defense of freedom in nearly every part of the globe. It is the United States, as a member of the CEDAW Treaty, who sent its troops to Thailand, 
to help uh, preserve the independence of Southeast Asia. It is the United States which is making the major effort in Vietnam. It is the United States which has the great number of troops stationed in West Germany today. It is the United States when the moment of crises come in Berlin that plays the large role. It is the United States which has poured out its billions of dollars of gold in order to help rebuild Western Europe. It is the United States which contributes to the economic and political and social development of Latin America through the Alliance for Progress. It is the United States on behalf of the free world that makes the great effort in space and makes the great effort in uh, national security. Our dollar payments, which we hear so much about, would long ago have been balanced. The United States would have had nearly all the gold in the world if in the last 15 years we had followed a narrow parochial viewpoint instead of uh, assisting those who we regarded as heavily pressed. We should feel a great sense of satisfaction in that and a sense of pride. The United States today spends nearly four or five billion dollars for national security interests abroad which add to our gold drain. This is only one of countless examples that could be given of the great role that we play in the defense of freedom at a time of maximum danger. So when we serve our country in 1962, I think we're serving the cause of freedom. And it is, of course, our hope that Western Europe and the common market will be an outgoing institution which will associate with this great effort and not merely turn into itself and build greater prosperity merely for its own people. So this is the effort that we're engaged in and will be engaged in in this decade, in the next decade, and the rest of this century. And therefore, the opportunity for all of you will be very real. In addition, I think the kind of problems we face now are entirely different than the problems we faced in the administrations of Woodrow Wilson or Franklin Roosevelt. And that's why I have tried to say recently that uh, the slogans and the cliches and the political arguments which so suited an earlier generation are not particularly adapted to the kinds of problems which we have. Most of our problems are technical, administrative, sophisticated, and merely being a member of one or the other political party does not offer you a solution to the problem. How to maintain our economy at a satisfactory rate of growth, how to mix fiscal and monetary policy in order to maintain employment and protect our balance of payments, how to uh, absorb at a reasonable return to our farmers the productivity of our farms, which is increasing twice as fast as our ability to consume it. All this in a very uh, hungry world. How do we protect the public interest in a great variety of economic areas and political areas which absorb our attention? These are all very sophisticated and technical problems. And the great sort of passions and movements of the early part of this century William Jennings Bryan and all the rest are not involved today because now it requires the finest judgments upon which even experts differ. And to do, though, bring a solution to these kind of problems in the midst of a very turbulent and uh, large uh, country uh, involved in more traditional political dialogues requires the best of all of us. So I'm glad you've come to Washington. This government needs your assistance. It needs the disciplines which you've acquired. Bismarck once said that one third of the students of German universities broke down from overwork, another third broke down from dissipation, and the other third ruled Germany. The question is, which third is here this summer in Washington? I'm confident it's going to be the future rulers of the United States. Recently, uh, I heard a story of a young peace corpsman named Tom Scanlon, who's working in Chile. He works in a village about 40 miles from an Indian village, which prides itself on being communist. The village is up a long winding road, which Scanlon has gone on several occasions to see the chief. Each time the chief avoided seeing him. And finally he saw him and said, you're not going to talk us out of being communist. And Scanlon said, I'm not trying to do that, only to talk to you about how I can help. And the chief looked at him and replied, in a few weeks, the snow will come. Then you'll have to park your Jeep 20 miles from here and come through five feet of snow on foot. The communists are willing to do that. Are you? And when a friend saw Scanlon recently and asked him what he was doing, he said, I'm waiting for the snow. Well, I hope that spirit motivates all of you. You're most welcome here. 
And I want to say that uh, come rain or shine, I hope that when you leave in August, that we'll have a chance to uh, have you uh, come to the White House and say goodbye. Thank you.